The Western Roman Empire in the third century AD extended as far north as modern-day Great Britain. However, the richest and most politically important lands lay to the west and south, from Provence to Portugal, comprising such present-day cities as Orange, Arles, Nîmes, Tarragona, and Mérithe. The Spanish and French provinces were connected to Rome via excellent roads, mountain passes through the Alps, and infrastructure for economic development such as aqueducts. From Provence and southern France, and also from Spain, agricultural products like olive oil and preserved foods such as garum, a fish sauce widely used as a condiment, arrived in Rome. These countries, in turn, obtained gold and money from the Romans. Spain and France were also very active in metal mining. In the first century BC, the philosopher Posidonius d'Apamea wrote, When a forest burns in Spain, you see gold and silver bubbling from the ground. After using force to conquer territories, the Romans built cities modeled after Rome and their allure was in large part due to impressive Roman feats of architecture and engineering. Peoples such as the Gauls and the Iberians, at first intimidated and in awe of the Romans' ingenious war machines, slowly became fascinated with what the Romans were capable of building. For decades, archaeologists studied Roman engineering to find out the secrets, unknown to most other nations at that time, by which the Romans were able to erect grandiose works with such stability, precision, practicality, and visual splendor, such as this incredible aqueduct. This is the Pont du Gard, one of the boldest structures of all Roman antiquity, built in the first century AD. The span over the river Gare, near Nîmes in Provence, is a full 157 feet high over 900 feet long, and no mortar binds its stone arches. But what is even more amazing is the mystery of how ancient engineers could build an aqueduct that brought water to Nîmes from over 30 miles away with a drop of only 56 feet from its source. The secret lies in this leveling instrument called corabate. It is a bench 20 feet long with plumb lines hung from it. When the plumb line is aligned with the guide mark, the top of the bench, corresponding to the water channel, is perfectly level. This means that the work has not been performed correctly. Hence, water will not flow and the slope has to be increased. Conversely, if the plumb line is too far off the guide mark, it means there is too much slope and adjustments are again necessary. To ensure that the aqueduct maintained its downhill slope all the way to its destination, the corabate was used to maintain the minimum slope as the work progressed. When the bench leans forward and the plumb line is just a few degrees off the guide mark, the surface has the right slope to allow the water to flow. More than five million gallons of water flowed over the Pont de Garde every day to fill a reservoir in Nîmes known as the Castellum Divisorium, supplying the needs of both the Gallic and the Roman inhabitants. But why did they need so much water? To find out, let's examine traces of the past still surviving in the modern city of Nîmes. Historical records and relics, such as this coin found in Nîmes, tell us that the city was given as a gift in 31 BC to the veterans of Augustus' army as a reward for their victorious participation in the Egyptian campaign. This ancient inscription reveals that the walls of Nîmes, known as Nîmauses in Roman times, were erected in 15 BC and extended from the gate for four miles to encircle the city. With a thickness of over seven feet, the city walls enclosed an area of 540 acres setting the stage for the birth of one of the largest provincial capitals in all of Roman Gaul. 
Archaeologists believe that only after the walls were erected did the city decide it needed water in order to survive and grow. And hence, about 40 years later, they built the aqueduct. The walls were punctuated with towers. 43 are known, but there must have been more than 80. One of these, the Tour Magna, built in Augustus' time, is 110 feet high and provides evidence that in that area there was an Augusteum, a sanctuary where the Emperor Augustus was worshipped as a divinity. All around, then as well as now, there were gardens, parks, fountains, and waterworks. The Roman colonizers encountered the indigenous population of the Gauls and intermingled. In just a few centuries, a proud new people and an advanced civilization had originated, a community that needed five million gallons of water a day. The Romans brought their spiritual beliefs into Gallic life as well. This temple was built in the year 4 AD and given the name Maison Carré in a subsequent era. It is one of the most beautiful monuments in France. Colbert, one of Louis XIV's ministers, even wanted to have it transported to Versailles. But why does the building have the same capitals as the Temple of Mars Ultor in Augustus Forum in Rome? To achieve the maximum architectural splendor for their city, the Gaul Romans of Nîmes used a strategy which was not completely original, but certainly effective copy the best of what had already been built. This magnificent amphitheater, Les Arènes, now used for bullfights, is one of many examples. The structure comprises two orders of archways punctuated by Doric capitals on both levels. Les Arènes seats 24,000 spectators in an oval 330 feet across and 430 feet long. In Arles, just a few miles from Nîmes, there is another almost identical amphitheater. It has two orders of arches, punctuated by Doric capitals on the first level, and Corinthian, the only difference, on the second. The lengths of the axes are virtually identical, as is the seating capacity, 26,000 spectators. The towers, which today distinguish the Arles Arena from its cousin in Nîmes, are of a later period. They were added in the Middle Ages, when the amphitheater was used as a fort. For a gladiator in ancient times, entering the amphitheater and performing in front of 20,000 spectators, it must have been a tremendous rush a chance to become both hero and champion. In the city of Orange, depictions on this monumental arch puzzled archaeologists for ages. There were naked prisoners in chains, certainly Gauls, and images of a triumphant Rome. But why would the Romans have chosen to show the Gauls in such a suppressive state if they were trying to win them over to their way of life and make them one with their civilization? Who would have ordered such freezes? The first thing archaeologists did to resolve the mystery was to try to determine the historic occasion for the construction of this triumphal arch. For a long time, scholars leaned towards Caesar and his victories reported in the De Bello Gallico. Then, after a careful observation of the pattern of holes in the architrave, they succeeded in reconstructing the original inscription. 
it was Tiberius, an emperor who lived much later than Caesar. Tiberius, though knowing all too well that the Romans and the Gauls were becoming a single people, wanted to send a warning to the indigenous population, reminding them of Rome's power and greatness. Protruding stones with a hole in the middle at the beautiful Roman theater in Orange were at first also a mystery for archeologists. But it is from painstaking study on details like this that archeologists discover the many secrets of antiquity. In this case, the research shed light on the comforts of Roman theaters. The perforated slabs are called modillions, and they supported wooden posts holding up a velarium. Just think, the best Roman theaters were equipped with a tent, roofing that protected the spectators from the sun and rain. In cities that did not have an amphitheater, the theaters were sometimes used for gladiatorial combat, adding real-life drama to what was normally just intellectual entertainment. Fresh from victories over the Gauls in Provence, the Romans pushed westward across the Pyrenees into Spain, all the way to Cadiz at the tip, securing what would become one of the most important areas of the empire. Modern-day Spain was known to the Romans as Hispania after they defeated Carthage in 197 BC. It became an extremely rich land by the third century AD, perhaps even richer than Rome. Tarragona was the capital of Rome's most important Spanish province, Tarraconensis. The charming Catalan city has been built upon the ruins of its magnificent Roman ancestor. Fortunately, many Roman elements have been preserved, such as the striking amphitheater at the seashore, the aqueduct, and other important archaeological finds. The work of archaeologists continues still. Most of their finds are unearthed, digging in people's cellars, or underneath or inside the houses and buildings of the modern city. Some of the buildings of the old city have strange vaulted ceilings, ancient supporting arches over 23 feet tall, separated by pilaster strips that lead into other vaults, all exactly the same. Studies have revealed that the vaults, all from Roman times, supported the stands of the ancient Circus of Tarragona, a magnificent hippodrome where chariot races took place. The main road into the city led to the Circus, which was on the lowest of three terraces that comprised the city's immense forum, over 180 acres. After years of research, Archaeologists were able to establish both the layout of the Forum of Tarragona along with the circus. Half of the circus, as we see from this section, was dug into the Tarragona hillside. The other half was suspended on vaults. This area, now covered by subsequent constructions, is still supported at its base by the work of the Roman engineers. These arches represented the external facade of the circus. It was where the spectators entered and were directed to their assigned seats. You might hear the sounds of the races already in progress as you entered. Chariot races were exciting contests of strength and stamina, mentioned as far back as Homer's Iliad, almost a thousand years before Christ. The forum stood above the circus 
and included the city's most important temple, the Capitoline Triad. At one end of the oval, there was no public seating. This was where the starting gates were, where the chariots came bursting out after the starting signal, ready to fight to see who would be the first to finish seven laps. Crowds loved the events. The races were even more popular than gladiator battles, and a circus normally seated twice as many spectators as an amphitheater. To properly set up the two U-turns, each circus had these three strange cones called metes placed near the curves. This was where the most spectacular accidents took place, which the Romans called shipwrecks. The chariot literally overturned, ejecting its driver, or auriga. The desire of spectators to see mishaps has not changed much in 2,000 years. For even bolder and bloodier action, audiences in Tarragona would have gone to the amphitheater to see the gladiators. Archaeologists discovered that there were walls in the amphitheater that did not belong to the original structure, but were built later. Historical records spoke of a martyrdom that occurred in the arena, where a bishop and two deacons were burned at the stake. Excavations revealed that a Christian basilica had been built on the site of the burnings in the 6th century AD. The Christians were persecuted because they refused to worship the emperors as gods. In Hispania, Roman culture found fertile soil and produced rich and flourishing cities, which in turn gave birth to illustrious philosophers such as Seneca and also great emperors like Trajan and his successor Hadrian, under whom the Roman Empire witnessed its greatest expansion. We are in Italica, an impressive archaeological site in southern Spain. Thanks to its two great emperors, the city grew in splendor around the second century AD. The size of this majestic amphitheater alone suggests that it once served a much larger city than what now remains. The subsequent Arab invasions and occupation, lasting more than 600 years, favored nearby Seville and left the beautiful Italica in abandonment. Gladiators, former slaves, criminals, prisoners of war, or even volunteer freed men, would travel hundreds, sometimes thousands of miles to fight in these big arenas, many times to the death. These grandiose events were offered as entertainment in exchange for political support from the audiences. In Meiritha, a signature inscribed on a statue tells us the name of its sculptor, Demetrius. Demetrius would have obviously been Greek and was probably a pilgrim or an itinerant worker without a fixed workshop. Works found here in excavations are kept in the Museum of Meiritha, the capital of the Lusitanian province, encompassing parts of Spain and today's Portugal. Studying these works, along with writings of poets and philosophers, reveals that Roman culture came from the older eastern provinces of the empire and spread westwards. From the Greeks, the Egyptians, the Etruscans, the Phoenicians, and the Persians, Rome absorbed the nectar of knowledge. As they conquered new lands, they enriched their culture, remodeling it, reinventing it, like the Republican statute or Roman law. To Spain, France, and Italy, the Romans brought a culture that was the sum of more ancient cultures, which over the centuries evolved into the Latin culture. The name of the city of Meritha, for the Romans, Emerita Augusta, derives from the worthy Roman soldiers who defeated the proud local populations. The city's symbol, a 105-foot-high aqueduct with three arches called Los Milagros, is a wonderful example of the Romanization of the area.
The city also has three impressive arenas, a theater, an amphitheater, and a circus or hippodrome for the chariot races. Sometimes three-day events were organized in Mayritha, elimination tournaments with no holds barred. The first contests would have taken place in this amphitheater built by Augustus in the year 8 BC. The second round would have occurred in this circus. While the final encounter of the last two surviving gladiators would be held in this monumental, well-preserved 1st century BC theater, decorated by two orders of Corinthian columns. If a gladiator was victorious in all three arenas, he would have been cheered and hailed by the crowds and the royalty as a conquering hero and given the most important and sought-after award, a wooden sword, the symbol of freedom. Having won his freedom, a gladiator would not have to return to perhaps his cold and barbarian homeland, but could spend his life in this inviting, warm city, at the western edge of the world as it was then known. A gladiator could live free in the great Roman Empire, an empire that had made him a slave, but allowed him to become a hero and a free man.